Hi there. In this lecture, we see Bobby Fischer playing against Luis Augusto Sanchez in the Santiago tournament round one. E4 from Bobby Fischer. We see E5, knight F3, knight C6, bishop B5. So standard royal pairs. Pretty standard stuff so far. And H3 here, knight D7, D4, knight B6. We have D takes, knight takes. Knight takes e5, d takes. Queen h5. So this is a very different pattern to the usual uh, closed royal pairs systems. This uh, knight's on b6 away from the king, and Fisher plunges with his queen, knowing that he's going to be provoking weaknesses potentially. If g6, you know, there's dark square weaknesses. We have the move bishop f6. But actually, even further, there's a more concrete point, not just provoking weaknesses. The queen is also hitting e5 is the more concrete point to note as well so g6 in fact we just play queen takes e5 here there's no penalty there's no backfire if bishop f6 the queen would just drop back so we have bishop f6 supporting e5 knight d2 g6 now queen f3 queen e7 and we have queen g3 and now bishop h4 and the queen actually goes to a very strange place to h2 funny enough keeping an eye on e5 there are perks to this because there's going to be more pressure on e5 building up and the queen can also potentially support h4 h5 which might mean a softening here and trying to get a key square maybe later on like f5 so a very interesting move queen h2 we see the bishop dropping back knight f3 bishop e6 bishop c2 bishop goes back and now bishop h6 kicking the rook and now h4 yeah we have bishop g7 and instead of trading bishops, actually Fisher keeps more tension in the position with bishop g5. And actually black played f6 here. We have the bishop dropping all the way back to c1. Bishop f8. And we have the move h5. Fisher is trying to create a weak square. And in fact, black obliges with g5. Perhaps this is one of the more controversial moves of the game. Pawns do not go backwards. This f5 square, if white can arrange a strategic bishop exchange, then that would be even greater with a knight outpost. You can imagine with the bishops off, a knight on f5 would be quite huge, uh, quite significant. If instead, if black uh, tried to avoid this g5, let's say bishop e6, perhaps the issue is knight h4, and white is in a position with a rook lift here with rook e3, and it starts to look dangerous. If queen h7 here, trying to stop any knight sack, rook g3, g5 would come along anyway. But this is under better circumstances if the queens are coming off. This is much safer for black's king. And the bishop sack is not too convincing, it seems. For example, like this. It seems as though it's an even position. So there are very interesting scenarios where maybe g5 wasn't strictly needed. But it was played here. And so we see uh, a plan based on f5 now emerging. We see queen g3, queen g7, knight h2, h6. And now knight g4, not minding the bishop taking on g4. You might think, well, bishop d1 to g4 is also an interesting plan. Perhaps, but the bishop's also got opportunity on this diagonal. So Fisher's keeping some options open. We have queen f7. If bishop takes g4 concretely, then queen takes... And this situation with b3, bishop e3, white does stand well and can play on the queen side. So white should have an advantage there. So we see anyway queen f7, queen f3, hitting f6, bishop g7. And now the knight goes to e3, bishop e6, knight f5, bishop f8, b3, suppressing the use of the c4 square, rook d8, bishop e3. Rook d7, queen h3. This is a slight inaccuracy from Fisher. It seems as though after this, black could have actually kind of used the pin and maybe trade on f5. It seems the most accurate is one of the more accurate moves, rather, is bishop takes b6 and playing like this. And even if black snacks on a pawn here, it's a very difficult position. That knight on f5 is like a very, very dangerous piece. And uh, some grandmasters call this knife f5, like Ben Feingold, this knight on f5. 
it's it's a very very dangerous position having this lurking around and knight takes h6 shows one of the tactical concrete dangers where rook d7 is picking up the queen so you don't really want this scenario this scenario is unpleasant and if black doesn't snack on a pawn then again you know white can sack a pawn and get you know get material back with huge interest here so yeah this bishop takes b6 seems more accurate than queen h3 but black doesn't really use that opportunity black plays king h7 if knight c8 using that pin opportunity then this situation is actually still of great interest there, there are issues bishop takes there's knight takes and queen takes d7 there are still issues here why it still has an advantage anyway but it gets worse than it maybe needed to be with king h7 bishop d1 knight c8 now bishop g4 knight d6 now this strategic bishop exchange so this is an ideal position coming up the queen's come off fisher doesn't mind even the queen's coming off he's got that beautiful f5 square to work with and now we see queen side play a4 rook takes the knight goes back away from the f5 square rook d5 rook c6 yeah these pawns look too dominating if taking uh c4 i mean it looks like a very dominating position now and in fact guess what fisher plays here if i give you five seconds to pause the video okay c5 yeah this is a really dangerous move it's a squishing move re restricting count play black plays king f7 now if bishop takes c5 this is annoying pin this rook c4 very very annoying pin so here we can just snap off rook d takes c5 so yeah king f7 was played rook b4 black's getting tied up now we see rook d7 check king e6 rook h7 it's like a mating that is also being woven here around the king we see uh, rook b6 if rook takes c5 then just taking and this is better for white and you might wonder well what about king's crusher bishop takes c5 what's the problem here the thing is bishop takes c5 rook takes there's knight f5 and it's not just a pretty knight it supports rook e7 checkmate and black's overloaded so you know here is checkmate ouch and if the rook moves then the knight drops so yeah big issues are in this position so we see actually rook b6 pretty desperate tactic idea c takes bishop takes b takes c7 rook c8 but now there's still this mating net nearly if only the bishop wasn't controlling e7 bishop drops back g4 cementing the knight knight a5 but now fisher plays guess what fisher plays if i give you five seconds here white to play okay b4 yeah this is a very interesting move and this is a fatal move bishop takes b4 that's being played before we get into that if knight c6 bishop c5 and white's winning material in any case this is just horrendous this end game is just absolutely winning for example like this you know the, the pawns queening if we look at this again uh, if knight c4 bishop c5 and then this is just again a winning end game white's mopping up loads of pawns so yeah it's pretty bleak so bishop takes but guess what the uh, tactical shot now that fisher uses which i've actually tested students actually on this fisher position very nice tactic here can you guess or what i mean rather work it out ideally to train your visualization and tactics so white to play what would you play if i give you five seconds to pause the video here what do you think fisher played okay it's bishop d2 yeah it's skewing the bishop and knight it, the game ended if bishop takes d2 that creates a weakness in the last move white does checkmates but there's a weakness of the last move. in any case here just we just take on a5 peace up thanks very much so for me the instructive points it's not just the tactical point in the end i think we're, we'll be throwing the baby out with the bar full for bathwater as the social scientists say and we just look at the tactic at the end the actual positional play is remarkable here with the queen going to h2 for this probing h4 h5 it's remarkable positional play inviting g5 black should have maybe stubbornly tried to avoid this because now white strategic play is more pronounced than clear cut around the f5 square and the interesting point is fisher's not so desperate to uh lose the knight for a bishop he doesn't mind that because 
it would still be an advantage. So he's kind of flexible. But later, there's nothing like, for me, a good juicy uh, outpost on d5 or f5. For me, that's the mark of a strategic crush. And here, yeah, this this is just very, very uh, painful, this situation with a potential pin if uh, knight takes, for example. It's it's a very, very dangerous position. So black's just getting tied up in knots. And yeah, the tactical finish. Tactics flow from superior positions. So you know what, guys? We need to know how Fisher gets the superior positions. <laughs> and then be good tactically as well. We want both the baby and the bottle. So we want to know everything about the Fisher instructiveness here. Otherwise, yeah, we might have the tactics, but not the positional build-up. So they're both remarkable in this game. Very instructive game. And pawns don't go backwards. Fisher encouraging, inviting, enticing, tickling for weaknesses. And playing on both sides of the board. A really, really quite amazingly instructive positional masterpiece, in my view. Okay. Thanks very much. Hi, guys. If you enjoyed this video lecture... You might want to get more at my course, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher, which I had a blast creating over 25 hours of video content. I tried to get the most instructive juice out of every single game covered and picking the most important games from this period. I had an absolute blast creating it, and I think you will have an absolute blast checking it out. And it's at a big discount code with this link. You know, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher has the discount code. So I hope you do check that out. Thanks very much.